Welcome to the Rainmaker Podcast with your host, Guy Costin. The goal of this podcast is to give listeners a unique look into sales strategies from top industry executives. We introduce you to the heads of sales and heads of distribution who will help you understand the inner workings of the successful sales organizations from philosophy to execution. This podcast is essential for sales professionals seeking wisdom from the best in the field. If you're not familiar with Dakota and their Dakota Rainmaker content, please check out dakota.com to learn more about their services. This episode is brought to you by Dakota Marketplace. Are you tired of constantly jumping between multiple databases and channels to find the right investment opportunities? Introducing Dakota Marketplace, the comprehensive institutional and intermediary database built by fundraisers for fundraisers. With Dakota Marketplace, you'll have access to all channels and asset classes in one place, saving you time and streamlining your fundraising process. Say goodbye to the frustration of searching through multiple databases, websites, form ADVs, and say hello to a seamless and efficient fundraising experience. Sign up now and see the difference Dakota Marketplace can make for you. Visit dakota.com forward slash Dakota hyphen marketplace today. What's up everybody? Guy Costin, founder and CEO of Dakota. Welcome to the latest edition of the Rainmaker podcast. I'm so pleased to be joined by Pete Lamasa, Senior Managing Director, Client Solutions Group, Head of Wealth Solutions at Bridge Investment Group. Pete, welcome. Ha- great to be here. So happy to have you here. So Pete Lamasa serves as Senior Managing Director in the Client Solutions Group, Head of Wealth Solutions at Bridge Investment Group. He is responsible for securing capital equipments, building and maintaining investor relationships, and growing the presence of Bridge's Client Solutions Group. Prior to joining Bridge, Pete was a Managing Director, Investment Specialist in J.P. Morgan Private Bank's Alternative Investment Group. In this role, Pete was responsible for fundraising and worked directly with clients and their advisors across the United States to determine appropriate allocations to hedge funds, private equity, private credit, private infrastructure, and real estate. From 99 to 2006, Pete was at UBS, formerly Payne Weber, where he worked in a number of product specialist and marketing roles in that firm's alternative investment group. While he was there, alternative assets under supervision grew from approximately 40 million to more than 9 billion. Pete started his career in journalism in the newsletter division of Institutional Investor, where he worked first as a reporter and then an editor and publisher. While there, he covered numerous aspects of finance, equities, real estate, pensions, technology operations. He graduated from the State University of New York at Albany with a degree in economics and minors in journalism and business administration. He's a guest lecturer at Hofstra University. Pete, give us a little background on yourself and where you started your career, family, the whole thing. Yeah, well, um, I started out my career back in the 1990s. I was a financial journalist. I worked for Institutional Investor. I was there about six years, covered um, a whole bunch of different beats. I was on pensions and then equities, real estate, compliance, fintech. Um, it was a great time to be a journalist. We were delivering a paper copy of a publication on Mondays. It wasn't uh, coming to your phone. There were no phones back then. And it was just a great time to just learn about finance. Uh, so I did that for about six years. And then I had been covering mutual funds for a while. So I said, well, maybe some mutual fund company would hire me to write their copy. And I ended up getting a job at Payne Weber in their, old, in their alternative investment group, just as they were starting it back in 1999. Um, worked there. Obviously, Payne Weber was purchased by UBS. I was there for seven years, was able to experience a lot of growth there, and then jumped to JP Morgan in 06. I uh, was there for 13 years in their alternative investment group. And then I was lucky enough to be able to jump to uh, Bridge in 2019. Okay, so fascinating. You start as a journalist. So any key takeaways from the foundation that built for you? Because a lot of people, that's very, very unusual, right, to end up in the position you are. So I mean, I love that. What, what are some kind of key takeaways from that experience? I think the two key takeaways are number one, um, everything in life is storytelling, right? So, you know, if you're writing a story about an industry, right, and you're covering something that's telling a story. And I think sometimes in financial services, when you're most effective, when you're talking to a client, you're telling the story of how your CIO does the job and how the market works and you know, where you where they get their ideas, right? It really, it's, it's narrative. Mm-hmm. So I think that's what I took from there. And the other big takeaway is when I was doing that, I often found myself on the phone with people who knew so much more about something than I did. So it, it was a little bit fake until you make it, right? So right. You, you, you lose all your fears about speaking to people because sometimes you have to admit, I don't know as much as you do. Tell me, right? right. And, and, uh, and that makes you just a more effective salesperson, I think, when you know what you don't know. So let's unpack a little bit this storytelling. Our second principle of our Rainmaker training, sales training, is become a master messenger, know what to say. And you have to take 
this complex investment story and simplify it. How today do you think of storytelling when you're coaching your team? Because storytelling, it's an art form, right? And practice and really being able to convey that because we never sell to the end buyer. You end up selling to someone who has to sell to someone else. So talk me through how you coach your team around storytelling. It's about reps, right? And right. that's why that's why I love being in the wealth space because you just get more reps, right? You get to talk more, you can tell the story more. When I'm about to hire someone or if someone's coming to my team, I tell them you're coming to the best place, <laughs> right? Because you're gonna get so many more at bats than if you were doing something in the institutional space. And the risk reward is so much higher. You know, when you're saying we better get this, it's a quarter billion dollar investment. It's right. gonna make our year, right? As opposed to, okay, we're gonna do this five times today. And we're looking to make, you know, a million dollars in this order or half a million dollars in that order. And it's really, I think, the best way to do something is to do it over and over again. It's like Malcolm Gladwell's uh, 10,000 hours. Right. And the storytelling, because that's such an important component. So you're not only getting into the reps, but even pre-reps is just taking the time to practice. So if we're, if we're thinking about who might be listening to this, emphasizing practice around the storytelling and really giving thought to how you're answering certain questions and anticipating where they're going to take you. Yeah, I mean, you know, we all have iPhones, right? So right. I just put my phone down and record, <clears throat> you're the CIO, I record you telling the story, and then I sit down and I just start translating that and right. making my own script, right? And then I build this script over time, and it starts out with, you know, why this manager, you know, why us, what's their, you know, I, I often joke, it's like, you know, what's your origin story and what's your superpower, right? That's you, the greatest. You know, where did you come from and why are you who, where you are and why are you better than everyone else, right? So origin story and superpower. And then from there, you just start building, you know, why now and what happens if this happens? And you, every time you get a question, you add to that script. Listen, let's, let's face it. Unfortunately, so much of what we do nowadays is on the phone, right? So that's the bad news. The good news is that you could have your script right in front of you. You could be cheating, right? right? And, and you could be stealing other people's words, right? Oh, you said that really well. Great. I'm going to use that. Like there's no shame in that, right? right? And you build your script out. You say it so many times that eventually you don't need it anymore. I love that. So origin story, superpower. One thing that I do anytime I work with a new firm, I simply say, and it's very similar to what you're saying, but I say to the portfolio manager, walk me through what gets you excited to get out of bed in the morning and come to work, right? Because then they give you something really passionate, right? And personal of what motivates them. And then, because in some ways, when you don't have the PM with you in a meeting, you can actually say stuff that is even better versus having someone with you, right? And then you can share those stories that, hey, I was speaking with our PM. Hey, they told me this is one of the things that why they're so passionate. So I love that. All right. Well, Pete, could you walk us through the structure of your team, kind of your role? And so we're really clear on what your role is. And then just give us a sense of how you're, you're the makeup of your team. Yeah, well, I'm part of a 30 plus person team and about a little more than half of those people are focused on institutions, insurance companies, pension plans, sovereign wealth funds, consultants. And then my team is focused on wealth. And wealth is is obviously a, is pretty broad in itself. Um, and it all blends, right? You know, the wealth management firm can look like an RIA. RIA can look like a family office. Family office can look like ultra high net worth, right? So they all blend uh, on the edges. You know, my team and I are focused on, you know, we've got about 10 different strategies. In any given time, maybe five or six of them will be in market. I tend to focus on probably four or five of those five or six because those are more appropriate for the wealth channel. Right. And where we've had a lot of success over the last couple of years, one of the reasons I came here was to focus on opportunity zones. So we've had some really good success raising capital and deploying capital in the opportunity zone space. And we've got relationships with a lot of the biggest wealth managers out there. So a lot of what we're doing is again, uh, this is just the way of the world now, sending out a blast email saying, hey, there's a paperwork deadline coming up, right? right. So, and hopefully you knock some stuff loose with that, right? And you write a very quick narrative as, as to what you're trying to talk about today, right? So what's changed about the story today? What's interesting today? Yeah. Why now? You know, if you're ever going to reach out to anyone, whether it's via phone or via email, you need to deliver something. It can't be Hey, like the hook of the email can't be, hey, I was hoping you'd give me money, right? It's got to <laughs> right. be, hey, I've got information for you that's going to hopefully help you make a decision, right? Here's a news story or here's a change in philosophy or here's how we're dealing with a, you know, the in rising interest rates. Here's how we're dealing with that. So what you're getting at is it's much more education, value added information, build a relationship, establish trust. And don't just go in and try to make the sale. Because even, I mean, everyone just kind of wants the money. But what you're getting at is add value, 
provide information that would be useful to them. Talk about, I'm kind of going to lead you here around when you think about what potential investors think about in terms of what they're actually looking for, right? Or the assumptions like that the salesperson has. And what I mean by that is, you know, there could be certain thresholds, there could be certain things that have to happen within a fund or something. And I was thinking during COVID, right at the beginning of COVID, we talked to one small cap value salesperson. They go, yeah, we're not, not calling on anyone. And I said to him, I said, why not? And he goes, because um, no one wants to talk to us right now. You know, it's too crazy. It's too crazy. I said, do you know how badly people are starved for information about what's happening in the small cap world? How your PMs have very interesting insights that you could share and you never have to talk about your product? So is it even along those lines, Pete, what your team would be doing in those moments? Absolutely. And you got to, listen, you got to take the good with the bad with the ugly, right? right? So you get a lot of credibility when things maybe are not going as well, right? So you're reaching out and saying, here's what's happening. We want to make sure you understand exactly um, how the fund is behaving, how the markets are behaving. And then also, you're in multifamily, there can be some preconceived notions about certain situations that are myths, right? Pre and then you're essentially can bust myths. Like, I thought you might find this interesting because a lot of people assume this is happening when actually this is the reality. Yeah, I mean, for instance, that's, that's a great example. And another thing I always say is nothing happens in a vacuum, right? So, uh, you know, higher interest rates means higher cost of debt. That's a negative, right? There's right. no disputing that, right? But higher interest rates also mean that mortgages are higher which means that it's harder for the average person to get a home. It also means that it's harder for developers to build because they're going to use floating rate debt. So that means that just like oil, right? With oil, you think about it. When oil prices go up, everyone starts to drill and then oil prices come down, people stop drilling, right? right. Same, thing in, same thing in real estate, right? Um, rents go up, people start to build and then rents come down, people stop building, right? So just when you think today might not be the best time to be selling something, it might be the right time to be buying. So. I want to close with this. I'm going to get your opinion because I want to move on to the next topic. But this is a really important one. How many times you heard a financial advisor, an RAA say, hey, you know what? I will always take that person's meeting because of the insight and value added information they provided to me. Yeah. And that's, and that's really what you're getting at, right? That's what you're trying to do. All right. It's such a key takeaway, right? Um, play the long game, right? So my favorite topic, right? Well, I've got many favorite topics, but sales process. Can you walk us through your sales process and like your basically your philosophy around does everybody on your team follow a similar or the same sales process? Yeah, well, I mean, first off, I, I'm really fortunate that I work in a very flat organization, right? So, you know, everyone above me is a phone call away. Um, I don't have to, there's no process or, you know, getting to the next person above that. So everyone above me knows exactly what I'm doing. I want to be really transparent. This is what I'm working on. This is what I'm trying to accomplish. This is where I, I'm, I need to be. We're producing uh, reports on that, you know, very regularly. Um, and then with my team, right, we're, we're trying to, we have got goals that we're trying to hit, whether that means getting a fund onto certain platforms or eventually, you know, generating the, uh, the, the sales. Right. And so is your team structured? So do you have an RA team? Do you have a wirehouse team? IBD teams? How, how is it Yeah, basically we're focused. We've got um, the people focused on wirehouses and then people focused on RAs. However, that blends a lot because a lot of it goes by geography as well. So right. there's, you should be able, you know, of course, if you fly into Cleveland, you got to do both. I love that. So we've completely done that for 17 years. We've always been generalists. So if you're going to Columbus, you're seeing FEG, you're seeing you know, Ted Finley, Fifth Third Bank, you're seeing Jim Gore, Thor, you're seeing, you know, everybody basically because you're spending all the money to get there, right? And then that, that actually makes, like, talk to me about how important that is to a salesperson, because then you're you're having to be very multi-dimensional around. In some you know, cases, a financial advisor might have, have a little bit of different pitch than when you're sitting down with an RA, which is much more consultative. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. How it really develops your team? Well, for instance, a, a great example is I'm going to Orlando next week, right? So, going for a conference, trying to build in some other meetings. I blast an email to my team saying, "I'll be in Orlando. Do you need me to visit with any of your clients?" And that could be updating a pension plan about a fund that they already own. It could be pitching someone on something that we're in the market with, right? So everyone on my team, again, I focus on wealth, but I'm happy to go visit with an institution if, if that's what's needed right? and vice versa, right? I want them, if someone's flying to wh wherever, I mean, I've got a colleague who's going to Iowa soon and she's going to stop in on a financial advisor and think about how valuable that is because not everyone's headed to Iowa, yeah. right? So we want to make sure that we're cross-pollinating whenever we can. Okay, so that reeks of team-based approach to your business. Is that a top-down from bridge? 
Yeah. yeah, and I think even I think more so than ever. I mean, our our chief operating officer uh, of the sales team just a couple of weeks ago said, "Let's not worry about." Um, credit. Yes. You know, at the end of the year, if you think you had something to do with something, you say something and I'll make sure you get credit for it. Like, let's just, let's just get the clients, make sure clients are happy and let's make sure that clients are educated and then the chips will fall and we'll make sure, everyone, you know, if we're, if we're successful, we'll be successful together. Reminds me of the story when we first started our business, maybe five years in and we're third party. And so we're working on an account and two salespeople are arguing over something. And I sat down with them. I said, who cares the least about who gets paid here. They kind of looked at me and they didn't know what to say. I said, our fundraising client, they just want the money. They don't, so they're, so all this stuff that we're doing, let's just bring the business in and maybe the house, we'll just, I'll pay both of you. You know what I mean? But I love that philosophy because that's just an all for one, one for all. I've got your back, but be a team player, right? Have you found yourself, this is maybe more a career question than it is, you know, individually where you have some salespeople just vote themselves off the island because they just can't, they just can't handle being a team player. I, I've never actually seen that. Really? I mean, I, I think I've been lucky enough to not be in that situation again, maybe because I've always been in wealth and it is a lot squishier there, right? I mean, the, you know, it's, it's less about, I spoke to that FA, it's more about, we worked with this wealth manager Right. And we were successful together. Right? So I've been lucky enough to not, I mean, let's say again, like I'm not dealing with the, I just brought in a quarter billion dollar order and it's mine, not yours, right? Right. Everything is a lot more incremental. So I've been lucky enough not to have to deal with that. That's awesome. Because it just, as you talk about the company and your approach, it just feels very team-based, all focused on uh, the company. So let's talk two things that, again, are near and dear to, I think, any business is communication. Let's first start with your team and how they communicate with you. What do I mean is, what's your sales meeting cadence, check-ins, whatever it might be? So just so the listeners can kind of get a sense of how you're structured from a communication standpoint. And when you do communicate, what information do you guys exchange on your internal team? I'll hit the second thing first. I mean, every, we're constantly writing up call notes. Um, and those are being broadcast to the entire team and then being saved in the CRM. So, you know, it, that's, everyone's doing that. You know, my, my associate's doing that for me. So um, walk, walk us through when you just said something very important. You said that's being broadcast to the whole team. How does that, what is the, is it email? Is it Slack? It's, it's, is an, it, it's email. Email. Yeah, it's, I'm pro, Slack's probably better, but no, 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 we're, we're, we're with email right yeah, now. Yeah, no, I love it. I, what, I, what I mean though is that's keeping everybody in the loop of what the clients or prospects are saying about the product, right? right? So everyone's able to absorb that and then use that information. Yeah, and you know, so email goes out to the entire team and then it's inevitable that people hit respond to all and say, oh, that's interesting because, right? Either I spoke to a client in that industry recently or someone else was saying the same thing about that type of fund, right? So that's where there's a lot of cross-pollination. And then within my team, you know, my team is smaller and you know, we're meeting on a regular basis. You know, we have a standing meeting, but we're meeting constantly because we're we're all together, right? right? And you know, of course, we're traveling, but we're all in the same place, and and we're we're constantly. You know, there's so much coaching that's going on. There's really trying to get the young people to to pitch, right? Hearing their pitch, hearing them pitch us, making sure they're doing the scripts like I do them. Uh, you know, what does the script look like? You know, how are you how are you augmenting it? And then what we, we try to do is we try to get them on the phone where, you know, if the pitch is three parts, you know, you do the first part and I do the second two parts. And then you do the first two parts and I do the third part, right? So over time, you hear them doing it. And li listen, I'm sure you feel the same way. Isn't it great when you hear their words come out of your mouth? <laughs> I'm sorry, your words come out of their mouth. It's like right. you get the chills, right? Like that's exactly how I say it. Right. That's great. You know, so I take a lot of pride in, in getting my young people up to speed. Yeah. That's a key, right? The the young people, right? Because that's what I think it's about is that, that youthful exuberance and teaching and coaching is really what I, I can see it in your passion and your your facial expressions, your tone of voice. You love the idea of coaching, but let, let's just be very clear. You work really hard and it seems like it's part of the fabric of your process is constantly reviewing scripts, pitches, and coaching. So when they go out there, they're really armed and prepared. Yeah, and, and just and things have to be tweaked, right? You know, for instance, we were, we've been talking so much about higher interest rates, right? What does higher interest rates mean? Nothing happens in a vacuum, right? So yeah, there's the negatives over here, but there's the positives over here, right? right? So how do we, how do we shape that narrative? So yeah, we're, we're constantly tweaking 
and we're constantly and you know our compliance people hate it but we're always you know adding a slide to the pitch book or or because i feel like if something's important enough to talk to a client about you might as well build a slide about it because you you want to kind of put that idea in concrete right this is what and the way you do that is by building a slide that passes legal and compliance right, right? If, so that now you know exactly how you should be saying it right so if you can get it on a slide then at least you're and, and also it makes you it gives you the discipline of writing the narrative and getting it into words and then of course you're not going through every pitch book page by page but you have that page so if someone asks a question well what about well, you have an answer for it i love that so many business leaders like yourself distribution leaders the consistency of coaching sharing helping team those are all the common themes and then you look at a firm which you have a very large AUM in your multifamily business, it's not a surprise, right? And then your COO, right? So that means the lead, one of the big leaders on the executive team is all about that. Like, let's focus on winning. We'll take care of everyone at the end of the day. I mean, that's just, I can see why these firms grow like they do because it's like, you just feel like you're removing friction. Yeah, well, our CIO, COO, he's been with us for about two years and I think his greatest accomplishment is what he's done with the, the, the analysts and associates and the way that he's uh, harnessed their their smarts and made them into better salespeople and aligned them with the the more senior people. I think that's probably his greatest accomplishment and, and what I'm most excited about what a nice I, compliment, when I work with him. Right? What a nice compliment. Okay, so let's talk about ex, uh, managing up, communication to the, the executive team. What is your process? Is that weekly, monthly, quarterly? Like how? To, and what are some so, uh, key metrics? And, and and remember, just for our listeners, I think that everyone's interested to know the cadence of what you communicate and kind of what you're communicating and how important that is. That everyone's in the loop and the know. Yeah. Well, it's um, weekly meeting, weekly email, and then constant check-ins, right? So no one's ever surprised about anything, right? So you know, these are the meetings. These are the big meetings we have coming up, and you know, maybe I can use your help on something like this, or, you know, I'm going to, Hey, I'm going to send an email and then I want you to go over the top and I want you to emphasize it afterwards. Right. Or I need you on this meeting or I don't need you on this meeting, or I need you to do something for me. So, um, that's, I, I really can say one of the best parts about being a bridge is that it's so flat. That's awesome. Matt Wicos, Eaton Vance, Morgan Stanley. He's been at Eaton Vance forever, obviously acquired by Morgan Stanley. I was just listening to some of the highlights of his, I mean, he talked about the open door policy for any one of his team members. There's no, you don't need to email me. You can come in and talk to me. There's no one in between us. It sounds like you guys have a very similar approach at Absolutely, Bridge. Absolutely, yeah. Very powerful. Okay. Absolutely. Let's talk CRM. Now, I'm a nerd when it comes to CRMs, okay, because I know it's one of the few leverage points salespeople have. Could you just give me, first off, what uh, CRM do you use? And then work us into your philosophy of how you most effectively use it for you and your sales team. We're using Salesforce. And... Um, we're using it for, uh, you know, for storing all of our, our client names, you know, even financial advisor names, because our to us, to me, my financial advisor is my client, right? So we've got everyone in there on those terms. We're able to slice and dice the information to know what financial advisors at what firms have clients in what funds. Um, we're storing all of our call notes, and um, and we're using this for. You know, listen, I, I'm not proud of it, but we have to do blast emails, right? We yeah, have to, of course. you know, that that that's the way of the world now, right? And so we're we're using them to craft our messages, and then and then get you know, be as precise as possible with um, you know getting the right messages to the right people. And you've obviously been able to get your team full adoption. I mean, this this comes up a lot. I know it sounds foreign to us, like why wouldn't I mean, because we pay our commissions out of Salesforce, we run all of our pipeline reports, we run all of our meetings scheduled, so everyone's in Salesforce on your team, clearly. Yes. Yeah. Walk me through the importance kind of as you, because because really sometimes when you're talking to people, they're not always bought into a CRM. Geez, how do you get people adopted, customized, everything? Bigger firms, you're almost forced into it just because you, you need leverage in organization. But even if you're a smaller firm, could you just give your opinion if you're giving advice to a $500 million firm that's, you know, the importance of them using a CRM and what's done yeah, for well, you? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's, the most important thing in sales is, is keeping track. Right. It's, it really is. If, if you're not keeping track, you know, everyone makes fun of me because I've got so many lists. Right. You know, so, you know, the tracker for this, the tracker for that, you know, so making sure that 
you know who you've spoken to because if you're doing as many calls as you should be, it's not easy to remember what you said to everybody, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, if you're only doing one call a week, you should be able to remember it. If you're doing 30, it's going to be difficult, right? So it's about memorializing things and, and making sure you have, you're using that to, to put yourself in a better position to succeed. So in our Rainmaker training, uh, principle number one is know who to call on. Uh, and if you're really good at that and you can channelize and you can do city scheduling and book meetings, then you do the meeting. We talked about being a master messenger, but three is tracking what you just said, right? If you're really good at doing all that, there's no way you can remember all the meetings that you've done. So what you're getting at is got to go into the CRM, got to go into Salesforce. I can run past activity reports and I can trigger sales actions with the notes of what I said and how I should follow up. Exactly. Fair? Right. Yeah, I love it. You got to track everything. That's it's a term I'm going to use because... I say it a little bit differently, but if your salespeople are that good and they're not entering that information, then eventually it's like a little bit of a sieve, right? The information falls out. And then unfortunately the salesperson is the one to lose. So as we have salespeople listening here, just how I, I always talk about, even if you're an individual salesperson, you have to become, you know, Guy Cost and Inc. And you have to run your sales, your, your personal sales organization as if you're a one person business. A CRM is just so vital, right? To managing all of that information. Exactly right. All right, brother. All right. Well, great. Okay. Now let's, uh, your leadership approach. So if you could just describe to us, and I really, we, leadership means a lot of things, a lot of different things to, to different people. What does it mean to you? And what is your approach? I think lead by doing right. And, um, like I was saying before, I, I love getting the young people up to speed and getting, getting them to a position where they can present. Right. That was why working from home was really tough. Right. In, in just having for that long period of time when we were home and having to invite people to a Zoom so they could hear you do a presentation. It was just a lot of, you know, we took it for granted how much how important it is to be together. Right. So I think that my leadership philosophy is you know, hear me do it and then let me help you do it like I do it. Gotcha. So the whole concept of lead by example, right? Could you just unpack that a little bit? Because is there, let's let, let get into the how, you know, you and I grew up uh, kind of in the same time in the nineties in the industry. It wasn't as, you know, I wouldn't say touchy feely, but people could be a little more direct, even maybe a little rude, even a little, be a little more, you know, judgmental that doesn't really work in today's environment. I mean, I kind of get, you know, a little sick to my stomach when I think about how, you know, people treated people in the old days. Today, it really is important, right? Clearly you espouse this of how you treat people could, because that's always to me culture. Could you just talk a little about that, how you and the organization treat one another? And if you're treating people nicely, then your teammates underneath you who are on your team are going to treat each other the same way. And how yeah, important that I mean, is. listen, I think it does, it starts at the top. You know, we're all, you know, listen, we're spending a lot of time doing this job, right? We're spending, what, 10, 11 hours a day, right? right. And, and let's face it, you're doing, you're on the, on your laptop, when you get home on your way to work. Right. So we might as well make it, let's all make it so it's pleasant. Right. And let's yeah. make it so we could all be successful and still be cordial to each other and, and, uh, and be helpful to each other. And the thing is, like I said, it, we said this a couple of times, right? Our success is our success, right? There's, of course, there's a pie and at the end of the year, everyone has to get paid, but, um, let's just all be successful together and we'll figure it out. So isn't it nice that you've been able to create an environment, right, that is kind to one another and cordial, as, as you said, and and, it can, and you can you can win big time that way. It's pretty special, right? I'm, I'm not Agreed. surprised, but yeah. you guys are so successful. But it's not always obvious, right? That kindness is a really key factor. Okay, young salesperson getting in the investment industry. What advice would you give a young salesperson? Get into wealth. Get into the wealth side. I mean, it's funny because you know I got in. I felt. I explained my story to you. I fell yeah. backwards into this, right? Like I yeah. was a journalist and didn't know what I was going to do next. And Payne Weber hired me. And next thing you know, I'm pitching people on hedge funds, right? I feel like from then until kind of like 15, the first 15 years of my career, I felt like wealth, financial services sales was kind of second class to institutional. And then everything started to switch right. back in, like, say, 2017, 2018, 2019. And suddenly, I think that it's become a lot more sexy, a lot sexier to be in the wealth management part of it. So I think if there was ever a stigma against it, that's gone away, number one. And number two, like I said before, 
the way you become good at something is doing it over and over and over again, right? right. And doing a pitch so many times and hearing a hundred different questions and being able to answer all of them and not even hesitating. I've heard this before. I've got an answer for that, right? right? I mean, it's almost like when you hear someone saying, I've got a question and then you're like, okay, I wonder what this question is going to be, right? And you hear, oh, okay, I know that. Okay, let's, let's, let's approach that. And then the other thing is when you think about wealth, you're dealing with such a range of personalities, right? You need to do that pre-call, right? And so who, who is this person who's going to be investing a million dollars in the fund? Is this, uh, you know, am I talking to a hedge fund principal who knows more about finance than I ever will? Or am I talking to a mom and pop who just sold their um, industrial business who don't know the difference between a stock and a bond, but they know their business really well, right? Because you have to approach those two calls completely differently, right? So it, it's... I think you become more um, flexible and you'll be able to improvise more because the range of clients you're dealing with are so much greater. So you're doing it more, you're doing it more, you're doing it differently every time. And I think that makes you just a great salesperson. And then the last thing I would say to a young person is whatever you're doing today is not going to define you, right? Like look at how my career has changed, right? Mm -hmm. I've changed jobs seven times, right? So just do the thing today that's going to teach you the most, where you can have the most success and then you can always do something else. You can, if you want to get institutional, do institutional later, right? You're 27. Gosh, you're get plenty okay. of time. So that's, you just answered the why behind why get into wealth, right? If we're talking to a young investment salesperson and you gave the career direction of get into wealth, because it seems like what you said, you'll be more multidimensional, multifaceted in terms of the audience you're dealing with and how you're going to have to position a story. I agree. Pretty powerful. Wow. That's a heck of a nugget there. Okay, so now... Let's talk about, we have two more questions. Uh, being a good salesperson is much different than being a good sales leader. What advice would you give that salesperson who's going to be getting into sales leadership and is going to have to lead a team? Yeah, I would say, you know, number one, lead by example. Like I said before, and, and, and make sure that you are doing exactly how you want them to do it. And then be generous, right? I mean, what I've often said is, you don't want the biggest territory, right? If if you if your territory was America, that's a very difficult territory to get your hands around, right? right. If your territory was, you know, people who live in Cleveland who are left-handed, like, oh, okay, great, that's great. That, that's a <laughs> finite list. Like now I can really make sure I talk to everybody, right? right? So you always have more clients, you always have more prospects than you need, right? right. So hand them off. Say, hey, take this person. You know, I, this is how I this is how far I've gotten with them. Right. They've only done X with us, but maybe they can do a lot more. Right. So, you know, just give them give them leads, give them warm leads so they could have more success. Gotcha. Well, yeah, because I always think about sales leadership and like you said, lead lead by example. Right. Be generous. It's not it's not an easy transition from a very successful salesperson because there's a lot of myths out there. So have you guys had to promote like sales leaders as well? Are you watching that? And it has to be the similar advice that you're giving them. Right. Because it's not an easy transition going from being a really good salesperson to being a really good sales leader. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you need to. I mean, I think that we're doing this in a place where people are seeing how it's done. Right. So right. I think that I think it's easy for us because we're, they're, they're in the soup. Right. So, you know, this is how we do it here. Yeah. So when I started our firm in 2006, our first client was a large cap growth firm. Unbelievable leader. Right. And I've had a front I had a front row seat. I still have for 17 years later to what I believe is one of the greatest leaders, decision makers, teammate, like you name it. Right. And I, we've literally modeled our entire business after him. And he never once sat down with me and coached me. I just observed, like you said, lead, lead by example. And then I just followed. So I, I couldn't couldn't agree more with what you're saying. That's pre pretty powerful stuff. But also, young people have to be cognizant of they should be imitating, right? And you should always be trying to take the best of what you see from different people, right? Great. Absolutely. Okay, to close, as a distribution leader, biggest challenges you're faced right now as a distribution leader? Phones, right? I mean, it's remarkable to me that five years ago, you'd be able to pick up the phone and call someone and either they would pick up because they were at their office and that's what you did with a landline, right? right? Or their assistant would pick up and if their assistant picked up, you'd be able to charm them a little bit and say, well, well, where is Guy? And, you know, if I send him an email, can I copy you on it as well? And that way they would have a little bit of buy-in as well. Now, when you call someone, 
you know, you're lucky if they pick up. And if they do, they're probably saying, what is this 516 number? It's probably spam. So you're already <laughs> starting on the wrong foot, right? So um, you know, that's, that's the biggest challenge, right? Because, you know, you can feel really good about sending 10,000 emails, but, you know, is that really an effective day? Right. Right. So it really is about trying to make those connections with people, trying to get those warm leads, right? So, hey, can you make a warm introduction for me? Um, you know, because I'm always happy to do that for someone else, right? So hopefully that comes back to me, right? So getting the warm introductions, um, you know, going to conferences, meeting people in person, saying you're coming to Orlando, when you're in Orlando, meet with them because you get those, you get that one-on-one, -on -one, you have that, right? right. I, I've met with you. Now you'll pick up my call. So I just want to expand just a little bit upon that. So do your salespeople end up having sort of little cohorts with other uh, salespeople at other firms where they will be making introductions to different financial advisors. Do you recommend that? So you yeah, I mean, I think I think we do that. I mean, I, I I have a lot of. I mean, I've got friends who do the same job as me, right? right? So just this morning, I was in the train station, and an old colleague of mine who does the exact same job I do for another firm was trying to maximize his raise at a firm that we both know, right? So he was asking me, who should I speak to here? Why are they not responding to this? How do they do? How is this firm different than that firm? Right. So I think we're all in this together. You know, I, it, you know, I think that you know, success is not a pie, right? If success was a pie, that means if my slice got bigger, your slice would automatically get smaller. Right. Right. It's not. Right. It, it's I don't know what the analogy is, but it's something that just gets bigger. Right. We could both be successful. Right. So what? Like I'm happy to help, and I get a real kick out of helping people. And I mean, if someone says, "Hey, I need," you know, again, just today, someone was calling up and wanted a career change. And I was, you know, noodling with him about how we can help him do that. Yeah. So law of reciprocity is real. Right. And then just, just generally helping. I'll never forget in 2011, I started earning some commissions and we were having some success and I realized it was such an empty feeling. It was, and I realized there had to be something bigger. And I put it on our website cause I just came up with this philosophy of the goal for our firm is to help other people get what they want out of life. And that's really what you're getting at, right? That's a core philosophy to share create groups, share information, make introductions. If people want career advice, help out, right? And Pete, it's just so funny we're closing this because you, you just reek of that type of you know ethos and personality. Thank so you. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this conversation and thanks so much for being on and sharing your insights. Thanks for having me. You got it. All right, everybody, that's another wrap of the Rainmaker podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We can't wait to see you on our next episode. You can find this episode and others on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast platform. We are also available on YouTube if you prefer to watch while you listen. If you would like to check up on past episodes, check out our website, dakota.com. Finally, if you like what you're hearing and seeing, please be sure to like, follow, and share these episodes. We welcome all your feedback as well. Thank you for investing your time with Dakota. Hey, thanks so much for joining Rainmaker Podcast. Hope you enjoyed the show, enjoyed the interview. I know I loved it. And hey, if you wake up in the morning and you raise money for an investment firm, you do cold outreach, whether you're a sales leader or salesperson, and you don't know about Dakota Marketplace, we would love to show it to you. It's world-class. It's used by over 880 investment firms and over 3,600 individual salespeople. To learn more, go to dakota.com and click on a free trial.